the story of the cross The Father loved us so, so much That when we did our very worst Jesus gave his very best And he died for all of us This is the story of the cross that we were broken, we were lost So then you built a bridge to us Took our hand, led us across Oh, I'll never know the cost If I said thank you a million times It's not enough But I'll sing praises for all my life I'm in love with you Oh, amazing grace Oh, you took my place Oh, now I am chased By your mercy, your kindness This is the story of the cross Jesus gave his very best and he died for all. How much? 
Morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship this morning. I thought I'm not sure there's a couple of faces I've not seen that often. So, if you're new to our fellowship, special welcome. It's great to see you. Um, I'm Jeff, I'm part of the leadership team here. If you're new to us, everything appears on the, the screens except for the Bible reading. You've been given a Bible as you entered uh, so you can follow the reading and follow the teaching. Now, we don't mind a bit of noise in church here, we're used to it, but if your child is particularly fractious, just so left to the sermon act, there's a room where you can do baby feeding if needs be, or changing or what have you, and uh, go in there. So we'd rather we have no children running around at the back during the service. Why are we here? We come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and our thanksgiving, to pray for the needs of the world, to ask for forgiveness of our sins, and to worship him together in this place. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray now that your Holy Spirit will move amongst us this morning as we are worshipping you. And I pray, Lord, that more Christians walk out the building than walked in. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our vision topic at the moment is being Jesus-centred. That's worshipping God, joyful in Christ and filled with the Spirit. And we had some great graffiti put up outside in the foyer there which explains what we did. I was shocked when I came in. I thought the vicar had gone mad. But anyway, it's wonderful to see it up there. Let's stand now and sing our opening song, shall we? Only a holy God. Stand and sing. Come on. 
It comes to a time in our service where we, as I said on the street, we say, sorry for God, I hope we're going to do more than that. I hope we're going to repent of our sins. That means we turn our back on our sinful ways. We admit to God now where we fail him and let him down so badly. And we're going to turn back to that and turn to him. So it is such an important part of our service. Some people can think that it's okay, I'll just say I'm sorry, and I can crack on as we normally do. But that's not what we should be doing. That's not what it's about. We take our choices, we make our sins, but we can't choose the consequences of those sins. And the consequences can be dire. In fact, are dire. So as we say these words, let's just think about it. And just for a moment's quiet now, let's just bring before God those things we really, truly regret and are sorry for doing. And let's vow to God that we'll change our ways and turn back to him. We say all these words together. And I say that because I don't like people confessing on my behalf. I want to confess what I've done wrong. So let's say together, God, God our Father, Father we, we come, come to you, you in sorrow, sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you, you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world of us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your son. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. So may Almighty God have sent his son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. We're going to declare our faith in God. This is where we stand up before God and before each other. So please stand. I we will speak the words in dark time. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, Jesus Christ, who took human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit down. Wonderful, great to see you. Uh, I think I know you all. My name's Chris. Uh, I'm a vicar here. Uh, what a joy to, to be together to worship God, our holy God, uh, together. Lots going on at the benefits at the moment. If you're not already on our mailing list, uh, and you'd like to receive the monthly emails about what's going on. Uh, there are just some cards in, in the foyer. You can fill one in, pop it in the box, and we'll give contact details. And we can actually uh, that list. Uh, thank you for everyone who brought these threads, loads of these threads behind me. It's making my tummy rumble. Uh, so thank you. Has anyone had? Has anyone eaten any Easter eggs yet? You're all very well behaved. <laughs> well done. I haven't eaten. Maybe a cheeky lint chocolate buddy. Um, so thank you so much for being collected this uh, this evening. Uh, and they're going to get a secret Santa who will distribute them um, to, to various agencies around Blackpool, Darwin. So thank you so much.
uh, for your generosity. Uh, Easter's not far away, is it? Um, and uh, we've got lots going on over Easter. So Monday, Thursday, communion service here in the evening. Good Friday, we're going to walk from here at 10 uh, to Church of the Saviour, have a hot cross bun and a brew, uh, and then have a service there at 11 a.m. Prior to service here in the afternoon. Uh, and then uh, a joy to worship our resurrected Lord together on Easter Sunday. Uh, so do uh, come along to those if you can. Uh, we have our community cafe every Thursday. And we've got our youth group, if you're 11 to 18, that's running uh, this afternoon at my house. Um, and then ne next Sunday, we're having an event in the evening, thinking through how we can be good neighbours to, to our Muslim neighbours, how we can uh, be good Christians to our Muslim neighbours. Um, Gerard Charles is going to speak in the morning, helping us think about mission, world mission. Um, and in the evening, uh, there's a special event hosted at Church of the Saviour. Um, thinking about reaching our Muslim neighbours. So that's 6.30 for Bruce, 7 o'clock um, for the uh, event. Um, hopefully, you've saved this date, okay? Um, if you're new here, we, I've actually saved this date 20 times. Uh, it's going to be an amazing day away, and uh, we've, we've, the tickets for this uh, are going to go live uh, tomorrow, and... Uh, I've got a little video to help us think through uh, what the benefits day away is going to be like. Well, I hope you're really looking forward to our church uh, day away at the start of May. I've come to visit the Shekinah Centre where we're going to be uh, and have a look round and it's a lovely cosy place. Uh, right in the middle of the countryside where we can relax, hear from God's word uh, and have great time together as a church family. This is where we'll be having our meetings. We can uh, fit 50 adults in here um, and this is where we'll be singing God's praises, hearing from the Bible uh, and spending time worshipping uh, together. Behind the meeting room, behind a solid wall, is a, a lovely cosy lounge. And this is where, during the meetings, our creche, our, our toddler group, uh, will be uh, very close to parents, um, but also um, soundproof, so kids can have a good time in here um, during the meetings. Uh, when it's not a meeting, uh, this is a place where we can relax, sit, uh, enjoy the sunshine and spend time together. Well, about uh, 10 metres uh, from the front door is another room called the Sheep Gate. Uh, this is a room where we're going to have our kids groups. Um, show you around. So we'll be having um, someone come and help us uh, to teach our children from the Bible. Uh, they'll be having their groups in here. There's plenty of room uh, and uh, they'll have loads of fun and activities together. One of the best things about going away together is eating together. And here we are, we're in the dining room. Great views overlooking uh, the countryside. Uh, this is where we'll eat together a light lunch uh, before uh, we head off to our afternoon activities. So do come and join us uh, for our church day away. Uh, Saturday the 4th of May, it's going to be amazing. Get it in the diary, get your ticket booked, prioritise that time with your church family. Uh, I guarantee it'll be a wonderful time together. Ticket costs are, um, it's uh, £20 for an adult. Uh, if you're a family of three or over, we can cap the cost for you at £50. 
Um, there are other options. If, if cost is going to be an issue to you coming, uh, there is an option to buy a free ticket. So you can, you can come for free. Um, and so come along if you can't afford um, to pay the full amount. Um, if you'd like to donate a bit extra so someone can come for free, there's an option to buy an extra £10 ticket. And that'll go into, into, the, um, into the kitty uh, to help uh, subsidise. Because we want everyone to be generous, everyone to be able to come. Uh, and everyone to enjoy this time together. Uh, so that's 4th of May. Uh, we've got someone coming to help us with our kids' group. So Sunday school leaders, you get a day off. You don't have to do it. So what's going to do that for us? Uh, and it'll be a wonderful time together. If you've got any, any more questions about that, uh, do come and talk to me after the service. Uh, have we got any birthdays this week? Any birthdays? Jim. It's been Jim's birthday. On Friday, I will ask how old you are. Seven, 72. Doing very well for 72. Happy birthday. Should we say happy birthday to Jim? Okay. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Uh, just a bit more news. Uh, um, at uh, Church of the Saviour, the other church in the Benefice, um, our church warden there is the um, chair of governors at St Wilfrid's, uh, and he asked us to share uh, some news that they've just had. They've had their Siams report. Siams is basically Ofsted for faith in schools, uh, and they had a wonderful uh, Siams report, um, really highlighting how strong uh, the faith is at St Wilfred's and how it perforates through everything um, they do. Uh, you can, I'm sure you can read the full report um, online. Uh, but we want to celebrate that we strong Christian schools uh, in our diocese, uh, strong Church of England schools. Uh, so I'm just going to pray. I'm going to uh, pray in the light of some of the things uh, we've just said before our next uh, talk. So as we come together as a church family, Lord, we thank you for the benefits day away. Uh, we thank you so much for that opportunity to be together and build strong bonds as a church. And we thank you so much for St. Wilfred. We thank you for the head there, the staff there, the governors there, and for the way the Christian faith is really alive in that school. We pray you bless them and help all the, all the children in that school uh, to know how great Jesus is. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to uh, sing again now. Um, church attendance, write it in the book. If you'd like to give, um, you know what to do. Um, let's sing, My God is so big. Let's stand. so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do my god is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do he made the trees he made the seas he made the elephants too my god is so big so strong and so mighty there's nothing my god cannot do So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do.
Well, our young folks are going out. Shall we? Uh, let's just pray for them and pray for the leaders. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks first for our crash and our Sunday school leaders. We thank you, Lord, for the efforts they put in for our children. We pray, Lord, you will give them wisdom and discernment as they bring our children forward. We pray, Lord, that seeds will be sown now that will grow into a huge crop of spirituality for the future. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do the reading. The reading this morning is uh, from Genesis 22, reading the whole chapter, and it can be found on page 22 in the Bible. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from, from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make you your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through all your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Some time later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Those the firstborn, those his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram. Kesed, Hazor, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. <laughs> Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. His concubine, whose name was Reumah, also had sons, Tabor, Geham, Tehash, and Malcolm. This is the word of the Lord. Speak to God. Thanks, Brian. Um, some great kids' names there. If you're thinking about naming your kids, any 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 names, any kids on the way? I think Buzz is my particular favourite. Don't think I'd get away with that. Um, 
Greg, if you bet over, we'll have a look at that passage there. Lots to take in, I think, from that passage. Um, have you ever had to uh, make a sacrifice? Um, the language of sacrifice isn't so common uh, today, I guess. Um, there's probably a reason for that. Um, but what I mean is, have you ever had to give up something you love, something that's precious to you, for the sake of something that's greater and more important? Small example. Rachel loves watching interior design masters. <laughs> I can't stand it. Because I'm a loving husband. I will watch that interior design masters program with her. A small sacrifice for the sake of my wife, who I love. Um, she'd probably say the same about watching the rugby or something like that. <laughs> and the way around. Um, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you're a football supporter. That's a sacrifice, isn't it? Season ticket at Ewell Park's not cheap. Three hours a fortnight. Don't always get the result you want. Um, perhaps, um, perhaps you're here today and you've sacrificed your, your career progression um, for the sake of raising children. Or maybe it's the other way around. You've, you've thought, oh, I'm not going to have a family so I can have a career. Maybe you've uh, sacrificed holiday or leisure time uh, for an ill parent to, to care for and look after an elderly parent. Uh, perhaps you feel like you're sacrificing a Sunday morning, I don't know, being here at St. Bartholomew's. And what about as a Christian? Um, the Christian life is sometimes um, referred to as a cross-shaped life. And what it means by that is, is the Christian life is a life of sacrifice, the Bible says. We follow a, a saviour who sacrificed himself. And so the Christian life is to be a life of sacrifice. So I wonder, are you, have you made sacrifices for Jesus? Uh, would you say, I've sacrificed certain things uh, because of my faith? And our big idea today really is this, that the faith, faith in a God who provides, leads to us being willing to make sacrifice. Faith in a God who provides means we'll be willing to make sacrifice. And this Bible passage it is all about sacrifice. Uh, if you've not been, been with us um, uh, for a while, uh, we're in this series in Genesis, looking at Abraham. Back in Genesis 12, God promised Abraham, didn't he? He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. Uh, you're going to have countless descendants. You're going to have a land to live in. And Abraham believed God's promises. He went where God said. And despite being old himself, he was old. His, fair, his wife, Sarah, couldn't have children. He trusted God's promises. And this is 25 years later, 25 years later, and Isaac is finally born. That son that God promised is born. The one through whom God is going to bless everyone. All God's promises rest on this boy, Isaac. And so what happens next is shocking, isn't it? Let's have a look down at verse one. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, and just to rub it in, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there. You know that child, Abraham, who you waited so long for? Your only child, that one you adore above everything else? God says, take him to the mountain and, and kill him. Sacrifice him. Kill him for God. And I wonder what went through Abraham's head there. Probably what's going through your head. You want, you want me to do what, God? What kind of God are you? Are you like those gods of the nations around who, who ask for child sacrifice? Are you that bad? How can you ask this of me, God? I imagine Abraham didn't get much sleep that night, did he? 
Uh, maybe he spent the night in prayer, crying out to God, asking, what, what's going on, God? Questioning God, pleading with God. But there, verse 3, after no answer, early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Abraham obeys God. He, he goes. And this isn't a short journey. It's not a sort of quick get it done, like ripping off a plaster. This is a three-day journey. How many opportunities does Abraham have to turn back? But he keeps going. And they get to um, Mount Moriah. And verse 5. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Just read that again. What does he say there? He says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Did you notice that? And Abraham climbs the uh, hill. He's got the fire, he's got the knife. Isaac is carrying the wood for his own sacrifice on his back. As Isaac goes up the mountain with his dad to be sacrificed. And at some point, Isaac must realize something's not right. So verse seven, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, father, yes, my son, father, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What are you going to sacrifice, Dad? And um, look at Abraham's response in verse 8. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. He says to Isaac, God will provide. We can trust him. And they reach the top of the mountain, and so far, God hasn't provided. There's no lamb, and, and Abraham builds the altar. I wonder if he took his time over it. Um, and he builds the altar, still nothing. And he, um, he arranges the wood on top of the altar, still nothing. And then he binds his son, and his son doesn't struggle or run away. And he places his son on the altar. And he takes out his knife. And he's about to sacrifice his son. And then the angel of the Lord appears. Abraham! Abraham! I imagine he was pretty relieved to hear that call. Here I am! Abraham says, what a relief. And now Abraham is told what we're told in verse 1, that this is a test. So verse 12, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him, because now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham, you've shown what is most precious to you. You've shown that God is most precious to you, that you revere him. First and foremost. And then just as Abraham said, God provides, doesn't he? Abraham looks up, there's a, there's a thicket in the thicket, there's a ram caught by its horns. He goes over, he takes the ram, he sacrifices the ram as a burnt offering instead of his son. And verse 14, so Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. He was right to trust God, wasn't he? And because Abraham has trusted God, he's had faith in God's promises. This blessing is confirmed again, isn't it? In verses 16 to 18. God swears that he will bless Abraham. He will make him into a great nation. He will give him the land. He will bless the whole world. Why, verse 18? Because you have obeyed me. Because you have obeyed me. He's been through that trial, hasn't he, Abraham? 
He's been through the tests. His faith has been proved genuine. And so he's strengthened, he's assured of the promises of God. Well, that's a, a roller coaster of a story, isn't it? Uh, what can we learn from this? Two, two things uh, I think we can learn. Here's the first thing God provides. We follow a God who provides. What did Abraham say to Isaac? God will provide. What did he name that mountain? The Lord provides. Imagine, um, imagine some of us may, may, may be able to do this with Darwin Tower, looking out the window each day, seeing that mountain there. And imagine each day Abraham opens his, his, window, his door, looks out of his, his house, and he's reminded the Lord provides. On that mountain, the Lord provided. Do we believe in a God who provides? Do we believe in a Lord who provides for his people? Jesus talks about that, doesn't he? He says, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about your clothes, what you'll wear. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about all those things. Why? Well, the pagans run after those things. But, but you know, Christian, you know that your heavenly father, he knows that you need them. So seek first his righteousness. God provides. There's no need to worry. There's no need to hoard our stuff. Uh, we have a generous God. And it's only if we believe in a Lord who provides will we be willing to make sacrifices for God, won't we? I can talk to you until I'm blue in the face about how we need to increase our giving as a church or how we need to come to church more regularly or how it's good to serve at church, all that is going to be useless unless we have faith in a Lord who provides. Only if we trust in a Lord who provides will we be willing to give of our stuff, of our time, of our energy. God provides. Um, parents, if you haven't got this book already, it's probably the best book you can buy to read to your kids uh, before bed. It's called the Jesus Story of the Bible. It goes through the whole Bible. Uh, and one of the things that is brilliant about doing is pointing you to Jesus at the end of each story, particularly the Old Testament. It points them to Jesus. And this is what it says um, on this story here. Many years later, another son would climb another hill carrying wood on his back. Like Isaac, he would trust his father and do what his father asked. He wouldn't struggle or run away. Who was he? God's son, his only son, the son he loved, the lamb of God. I'm told in the New Testament that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Or as uh, Tim Keller puts it, Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up to his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us. And when God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, him you love from me. Now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrificing him and saying to God, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. So how do sinners like you and me approach and worship a holy God, the God we, we sang about in that first song? How can people who fail to trust God, who failed to put God above everything else, how can we find forgiveness and hope? How does God fulfill his promises to broken and rebellious people like us? Through the willing sacrifice of his one and only son who we gave to take away our sins, to forgive us and provide a way for us to be blessed.
Have we put our trust in the God who provides, who provides his son, who loves us that much to die for us? Because it's only when we grasp that, that we'll be able to make sacrifices for God. It's only if we understand God's provision that we will have faith that makes sacrifice. Abraham here in the New Testament is, is, is held up as a, a great example of faith. So uh, listen to Hebrews 11, I think it's on the screen. Uh, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Here's why. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. What's that saying? Abraham trusted God's promise. God had promised that Isaac would grow up, have children. And that's the family line. That would be the family of blessing. And because of trust, because Abraham trusted that promise, he knew that God would save Isaac. He didn't know how. Maybe even God would have had to rise, raise Isaac from the dead, he thought. But he trusted God so deeply that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And why does Abraham believe that? Why is Abraham's faith so strong? Well, because for 25 years, Abraham has walked with God, hasn't he? For 25 years, Abraham has stuck with God, and God has stuck with Abraham through the ups and through the downs. When Abraham's messed up and done stupid things, God's stuck with him. God's kept his promises. God's been faithful again and again and again. It might be you're here this morning and you're thinking, how dare God test Abraham like that? How dare he? And it is a struggle, isn't it, this, this story for many? But can I encourage you to get to know God better? To walk with him like Abraham did for those 25 years? I may encourage you to, to, to read about him, to spend time with his people, to, to, to put your trust in him if you haven't already. And as you do, you'll, you'll come to understand that he's the God who provides. I remember I was a, a young Christian, I'd gone off to university, I was part of this Bible study group, and uh, they were talking about whether they'd be willing to, to sacrifice their lives to Jesus, you know. And in some countries, that's a reality. If you say I'm a Christian, um, you can get shot or, or, or killed. And they were there going, oh, I'd like to think so. Yeah, I would do. I'd like to think so. And I was there thinking, you bunch of idiots. Are you mad? Why would you do that? I didn't say it because I wanted to appear holy. <laughs> but you know what? As, as, as I got to spend more time with Jesus, I got to know him better. As, as I realised how good he is. That he's the God who provides again and again and again. That he's the one I can trust. It started to make more sense to me. And the faith of Abraham doesn't come on overnight, does it? It requires walking with God for years, spending time with him, drawing closer to him, getting to know him. What, what will it look like for you to do that, I wonder? And as that faith grows, it becomes faith that is willing to make sacrifices. I came across an interesting quote while I was preparing this sermon. It's by a lady called Annie Dillard, who, who is actually a Christian, but she writes this. A life without sacrifices is an abomination. Interesting, coming from a non-Christian. A life without sacrifices is an abomination. And I think she's referring, she talks about a candle, how the, 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 the sacrifice of the wax to light up the room. 
He's talking about how, how sacrifice can be a good thing, but a life without sacrifice is an abomination. And I think we live in a world that we're told we don't need to make sacrifices. We're told we can have it all. So, um, so we can have the job, we can have the family, we can have the community, we can have the faith, we can have the nice stuff. That's, that's what we're told. And that is a lie. That is not true. You can't have it all. The Christian life requires we make sacrifices. Life requires we make sacrifices. We always need to prioritise some things over others. We always need to choose some things over others. And it's a lie that leads to disillusionment. So as we're left asking, why can't I have that quality family time and that good job and that clean house and that nice holiday and that new car? Why can't I? And it's also a lie that's doing major damage to our Christian walk and witness too, I think. Because it's impossible to live effectively as a Christian without making sacrifice. <clears throat> I'll say that again, it's impossible to live effectively as a Christian without making sacrifice. Not just my words, it's what Jesus says. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that's a call to die, isn't it? Take up his cross daily, sacrifice daily, and follow me. So whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You cannot follow Jesus without sacrifice. So I guess the question to leave with is, what will it look like to have sacrificial faith for us today? In what areas of, of our lives will be different for all of us, won't it? Will we be challenged to make sacrifices in order to worship God, to put him first, um, to do his work? It's pretty radical, isn't it? Here's a, here's a few examples, um, which may or may not be helpful. What about in the, in the area of work? Uh, is your job or your career preventing you from worshipping God? serving his people what will it look like to make sacrifices in that area reducing your air reducing your hours and taking the pay cuts having a word with your boss and saying no i'm not doing that might be consequences so you know what i'm not going to do that extra shift on a sunday even though it'll give me a bit more money so i can be with my people my, my family my church is that an area where we might need to make sacrifices? What about in the area of money? What would being sacrificial with our money look like? I'm aware that for some people here today, putting five quid in the box on a Sunday is a sacrifice. What a, what a joy to seek God's kingdom first. But I wonder, and I'm including myself in this, I wonder if most of us, when push comes to serve, aren't actually giving sacrificially of our money. Not really. Because sacrifice involves giving something up, doesn't it? So it'll mean getting the cheaper phone contract so I can give more. Or maybe the, the slightly older car so I can donate more to charity. Or the, the one less star hotel for holiday. <coughs> so I can give the gospel work, or, or the longer repayment term on my mortgage, so I've, I'm less tight, so I can give more generously. I don't know what it would look like for you, but what would it? It's a sacrifice in that area. Uh, what about time? I wonder if this sounds familiar, maybe to some of the families here. Um, you've had a family, you've come to church, it's great. Uh, especially when you're on maternity leave, it's brilliant, you've got all the time in the world, haven't you? And um, Sunday morning church is nice, you've got the crash at the back, it's nice and easy. Uh, you're growing in faith, you're getting to know people, 
what a joy. But then money starts to get a bit tight. Um, both you and your husband need to go back to work. The kids grow up, they want to do activities on a Sunday and a Saturday and every other evening of the week. You're ferrying them around, you want to have family time, you, you want to lie in at least once a week. What's going to get sacrificed? Sadly, it is church on a Sunday for many. What would it look like to sacrifice in a way that puts God first rather than our families first? <coughs> There's lots of other areas, I'm sure, where we need to think this through. Um, what it looks like to live a life of sacrifice for Jesus. But just, just as a finish, and, and let's remember the ultimate sacrifice Jesus made for us, yeah. That's how much he loves us. He doesn't call us to do anything near as much as he's done, but we're to walk in his way. And I just want, as we finish, to think, what did sacrificial faith lead to for Jesus? What did it lead to? Well, it led to glory, didn't it? Philippians 2. Jesus, Jesus gives up his life, he sacrifices his life, what happens? And then God exalts him to the highest place. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Sacrifice <coughs> leads to exaltation. Because we have a God who provides. For, for Abraham, being willing to sacrifice led to the blessings of God renewed. And you know what? If we trust in a God who provides, we trust that when we make sacrifices for God, it's better for us in the long run. That God provides, that God exalts, that God, God glorifies those decisions. He blesses them and he blesses us through them. <laughs> Let's just take a moment uh, of quiet maybe to think some of those things through. Lord, we're so sorry when we so quickly sacrifice the spiritual things, the, the time with you, for the sake of those other things that are less important. Please forgive us. Please help us. Please remind us that you love us so much. You gave your son for us. And maybe we've been pricked in, in, in our consciousness and our spirit to, to look at certain areas of our lives and think through what it looks like to wholeheartedly follow Jesus, to, to take up our cross daily in those areas. And Lord, please give us the strength to make the changes we need to. Lord, we trust you. You are the God who provides. <coughs> You are the God who is with us. Thank you so much. Amen. Now we're going to sing uh, now how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Let's stand.
Let's pray to our glorious God, who always provides. Lord of the morning, we offer our thanks and praise for your gift of this new day. It is a blessing to us, and in our faith, we can experience gratitude and give you thanks despite the circumstances and the storms of life that may surround us. We give you thanks for your care of us and your unconditional love. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life in atonement for our sins past, present and future. He is the saviour and redeemer of the world. <clears throat> we thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us and guides us to salvation, keeping us on the path you have designated for us and helps us to be the best that we can be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, thank you that we can worship you in safety. Would you please protect the suffering church and all those who worship in fear of their lives, especially those who have converted to the Christian faith. We pray for all those who are out in the mission fields and we would bring before you our missionary partners, the Marshalls, the Bells and the Davies. Would you please protect them in all that they are striving to achieve Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for your church throughout the world, that it may grow. And we pray for all clergy, that they may be men and women of the faith, teaching biblical truths only. We pray for our church leaders, for Chris, James, for Jeff, Duncan, Phil and John and for all who have responsibilities within our two churches. We pray for our congregations, and we ask that all those who come through our doors feel a sense of a warm family welcome that will make them want to come again to learn more about you. Father, we pray that we can reach those on the estates around our churches so that we can tell them about your gospel and let them know what a glorious God you are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for peace and an end to wars and conflict in all those countries that are suffering. For those who through conflict are starving, 
those who are being displaced because there is literally only bombed out towns and cities left, for those who cannot grow their crops because of extreme weather conditions. Look upon these people, Father, and would you relieve their suffering by helping the agencies get the much needed food and medical supplies to them. We pray for the world leaders and all those in authority to recognize and seek the dignity and safety of those they are responsible for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our nation and our political leaders that you will endow them with wisdom, understanding, discernment and knowledge and guide their decisions in all things to reflect your will and good purpose. We pray for our king and the royal family, especially those members who are recovering from surgical procedures, that they may recover fully to perform their duties for the good of this nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <coughs> Lord, we pray for all institutions who are seeking to help those in need. At this time, we pray for a food bank, for Christians Against Poverty, and for Night Safe. Just three in hundreds of charities that are trying to make a difference for those who are struggling. Please let us be generous in our giving and thankful for the blessings we have received through your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, we pray today for all those who have woken in pain and for those who can find no relief. For the homeless, the lost and the lonely, those suffering addiction, and for those without any families, please put your hand on them, Lord, and within your good, pleasing and perfect will, release them from their suffering and anxiety. Lord, we pray today for Yvonne Gray, Sandra, Laura, Catherine, Lynn, Lorraine and Jeff, Maud, Sylvia, Ted, Jen, Anne Marie, Frank and Tony, Gillian and Brian, Roland, Celtic, Angela, Joan and Catherine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, there are many today who are suffering the loss of a loved one. We pray for these people, Father, that their pain will lessen as the weeks and months go by, and that their memories of their loved ones will help them to heal. We pray today for the family and friends of Doreen Goldsborough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, give us this day the wisdom to recognise what things are important. Show us what to do with the time and the talents you have given us. Strengthen our faith, give us hope and help us to trust implicitly in your guidance all the days of our lives. Lord, in your infinite mercy, hear our prayer. The diocesan prayer. Heavenly Father, we embrace your call for us to make disciples, to be witnesses, to grow leaders and inspire children and young people. Give us eyes to see your vision, ears to hear the prompting of your spirit, and courage to follow in the footsteps of your Son, our blessed Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say together that wonderful prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory 
for yours, now and forever. Amen. I can see faces beyond the glazed door. Here they come. Well, there's a couple of people carry a big piece of paper, which I suspect. Well, I thought they were going to come up here and show us. Okay, right. Well, well somebody's got something. Okay. Yeah. What have we been learning about? We've been learning about how we learn about this. Well, we've been learning about the stars and how we learn about the stars and how we learn about the stars and how we the is that promise too? Yes, well done. We're going to feel like this into big church as well. So, seeing our clothes in him, when I survey the mother's cross, let's stand and sing. <laughs>
We've heard a lot about sacrifice today and a lot from Scripture. So I pray, Lord, that your holy word will be a guide to our paths and a lamp for our feet. Now, as we leave this place, we can take your holy word on board in our hearts and follow it. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Leave us a couple of biscuits, kids. <laughs>